Oh, so, I want to talk tonight uh, briefly about supping together and uh, what that means. And when we think about this, this is Good Friday. So we, we had Great and Holy Monday and Spy Wednesday, and now we're on Good Friday. And uh, it represents the day our Lord and Savior Christ sacrificed himself for us, for us that we might have redemption on the cross. And, and tonight I want to talk about one of the great benefits of salvation. And, and it is supping together for eternity. And, and I was just thinking in those terms uh, as we, we look at it. And, and uh, I want to look at Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 16 through, or 14 through 16. And, and it's where the Lord is talking about the Passover. And, and uh, be, just before he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he makes that statement that I long to eat this meal with you. So if we look at verse 14. It says, when it was time to eat the Passover meal... Jesus and the apostles were at the table. Jesus said to them, I've had a deep desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I can guarantee that I won't eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And, and so, you know, as I look through that, having a meal and time of fellowship with his disciples was vitally important to the Lord. And when we think about all that's going on during what we call the Passion Week or Holy Week, the, you know, with the triumphal entry and the, the different things that are happening each day and the challenge of his authority, the betrayal of Judas, the knowledge that he's being betrayed, um, all of that. And, and, and knowing, you know, when he goes to the garden, we know that he says, I'm, my soul's sorrowful unto death. So the Lord's carrying this sorrow with him. And he goes to the garden to pray, and he knows after that he's going to be betrayed and, and crucified. And it's in the garden that he prays, you know, Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass from me. But just before that, he makes that statement. I have earnestly desired, or I long to have this meal with you. And, and it, it, don't make a mistake here. It's about fellowship. It's about interaction with the men that he discipled and walked with for three and a half years. It wasn't about religious trappings. It was about love and mutual appreciation. Jesus wasn't instituting the ceremony of communion per se, but fellowship and connection as a practice. And, and even as we think when the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper, and he says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And, and, you know, we practice communion and that's good. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't little cups with juice and crackers. It was, they were eating, they were having a meal, they were together. And, and, and we know, you know, the way they would eat meals, they would kind of be reclined and comfortable and, and all of that sort of thing. And that's what he was talking about. As often as you're together, as often as you fellowship, as often as you eat meals and break bread together, do it in remembrance of me. And, and very personally, he's saying to his disciples, who were his best friends, every time you guys gather, I'm going to be gone. We're not going to see each other. And, you know, we're not going to get to have this meal together until heaven. Every time you gather, remember me. And that's beautiful. As he notes that I have a, a deep desire to eat this meal with you, to sup together. Fellowship is a desire of the Lord. Fellowship with us is a desire of the Lord. When God came into the garden in the cool of the day, and we see that, you know, in the Garden of Eden, the Lord would come in the cool of the day to do what? To fellowship with man. To interact with him. And the only thing that broke that sense of fellowship was man's guilt over his sin. And then Adam ran away. But the Lord still wanted fellowship. And, and the plan to restore fellowship is redemption. And, and so I think about that. When Jesus meets with us, it's still God's desire for fellowship that's taking place. And, and I, you know, I was, I was talking with uh, someone the other day, and, and uh, we were chatting about things, and, and that's actually my son-in-law, and he was telling me, you know, the Lord's telling me a lot of stuff. Why do you suppose he's doing that? I said, because you're his friend. And when God shares his ideas with his friend, 
And, 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 you know, I think about that. There's so many times the Lord's sharing his heart with me. And it's not so I can have a sermon. It's so I can have a relationship. And we get that. We, when we get together and we have conversation and interaction with each other and we feel it's meaningful, it's because there's a relationship happening. And that's what we call fellowship. That's something together. <clears throat> and when the Lord shares his heart with you, that's what he's doing. Why does God tell us things? In one place, he notes even to his disciples, I'm telling you everything because you're my friends. And, and you know, do we think about that friendship with God? And, and the other thing we begin to realize is that watching his disciples fellowship together was of deep importance to the Lord. It wasn't just about his interaction with his disciples. It was about observing their interaction with each other, their bond to one another. And, and we know that, you know, they might have had their issues, but they had a bond because it carried on afterwards, didn't it? And, and it was a great reminder of why he came. When the Lord sees the church gather together, it is God's plan. And, and when God witnesses his people in fellowship, he understands that's the purpose of redemption, one of the great purposes. And, you know, this is such a gathering. We find strength in each other. As a family, not a religious institution. And, and so when we think of that, that the strength we find gathering together in the name of the Lord is gathering as a family of friends, not as an institution, as a church. And, and the distinction is simply this. Learn to like each other. Learn to connect. And, and, and God will bring fruit in that. Jesus also referenced the great family reunion. Just before I go into the great family reunion, uh, you know, I think it's funny that the Lord lays words like this on my heart about the importance of fellowship because I'm I'm fairly reclusive, you know, and, and that's what's funny, you know. It's like I I know people that will do anything just to interact with others, and and I'll sit at home for hours and hours and be totally fine. So I know it's the Lord because it's not me. Just so you get that, and and, and I still enjoy fellowship. I just know this is really a thing more on God's heart. Jesus also referenced that what I call the great family reunion. And uh, as he says that, right, this is my last time that I will eat this meal with you before we eat it together in heaven. And, and so when we think about that, the marriage supper of the Lamb, right, that's the great family reunion. That's where we connect. And, and you know, when you do get a chance to connect with people that you haven't seen in a while, have you ever noticed there's just not enough time? As much as I will be alone, there are times like we, we've gone to some events where we met some people from our college days. And, and at some point in that evening, Debbie's pulling on my arm saying, Charles, and we're all, because we're all talking, we're catching up. Think about that. Debbie, you're not going to get to rush me in heaven. <laughs> we're going to fellowship as long as we want there. <laughs> Think about that, right? Isn't it beautiful? And... And uh, that's what Jesus is saying to them. I'm gonna, we're not going to do this together until heaven. And, and if you consider, you know, just a little bit, some of the, the testimonies that people have had, and, and I don't put a lot of store in all of them, but there are some certain constants when people test, give a testimony about having gone to heaven and come back and things like that. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some are made up, but some are likely genuine, and there are certain constants that they see. And, and I was thinking about some of those constants, and, you know, everybody talks about the Lord being there and the presence of the Lord there, and so that's powerful. And, and then they talk about music. The worship music is phenomenal and amazing, and, you know, uh, those kinds. Of, I remember the Lord kind of let me hear something once, and, and I was hearing five languages coming out of one mouth at once. And I remember thinking about how phenomenal that was and, and this idea of angelic worship. And um, So everybody talks about, you know, music that can't be imagined by humans. And, and the other thing they talk about is people. 
every testimony about someone having seen heaven, they identify others. Relationships, relatives, friends, people that they have fellowship with. And, and those are the constants, the Lord, the worship, and the fellowship. Those are the, those are the big three things we always hear about in heaven. And we get glimpses of that, you know, when we read in the scriptures about the angels worshiping. And we read in the scriptures about they, they mutually rejoice together. And, and, and they cast their crowns. And all these things are happening because there's a mutual relationship that honors the Lord. And so I was thinking about that. You know, uh, I grew up in a setting where um, gatherings revolved around, you know, basically food fellowship and a musical free-for-all. And, and that, that's, you know, I grew up in that kind of setting. And, and uh, they'd have the long church services. We'd have these Saturday services that went church events that went all day. And they'd start in the morning. And then you'd have service. And then there'd be this big lunch. And then you'd have another service. And... And there was just all, all the musicians would show up, and, and it wasn't, it was pretty random. And they would just be jamming together and playing together and all of that. And, and uh, I was thinking about it. I have a lot of fond memories attached to that. And um, I think heaven will be more like that than it will be a formal dinner. And, and I often, you know, in fact, one of my favorite memories of a, a fellowship thing, just in terms of what I felt in my heart about it, was uh, there was a there was an old gentleman named Carl Callahan that that uh, was in my dad's church that he had pastored, and the church building had been a dance hall, and Carl played for the band, and when it became a church, he just stayed, and uh, were, he loved the Lord, right? He really. And uh, so, you know, I, he, I was growing up in the church and started playing guitar, and he and I would play together, and it was really quite an experience, and, and he was a talented musician. And, uh, and then, you know, I grew up and went to college and so on and so forth and didn't really see him. And, and, but later on, I was a pastor uh, in a different movement, and we were having one of these gatherings, and and Carl walked in the door, and he played a Rickenbacker, and uh, he walked in the door, and he had a big smile on his face and said, I've been just looking forward to playing with you again. And when I think of that, of course, I called him Brother Callahan because he's older than me, but when I think of that, I think that's, that'll be heaven. And he's with the Lord now. And I know when I get there, that's what he's going to say. And, and I, I, so I was, I was thinking about when uh, Debbie's dad passed away, and, and I was thinking, of course, of my dad, too. And my dad always, he never, my dad was a, you know, his family's from Arkansas, so he wasn't the most refined fellow. But uh, he, he never called dinner dinner. He called it supper and he called lunch dinner. And my mom didn't like, always like that because he wasn't very refined. But he'd always say, let's go have supper. But, but the distinction there for, for people who think of it that way is that supper is something you have with your family and dinner is something you have at a restaurant where you have to have special manners. And, and I think about that when I think of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That, you know, you see those paintings sometimes of the marriage supper of the Lamb and nobody's there. And there, there's just a lot of tables with goldware and fancy tables stuff that you can't spill any crumbs on and uh which would make you know me nervous because the older i get the harder it is to find my mouth oddly more <laughs> experience but i'm i'm worse at it and uh and i'm not alone i've seen y'all eat uh, <laughs> but but supper's not gonna the marriage supper of the land's not gonna be like that and i'll, I'll never forget you know when, De when debbie's dad passed away we were praying, and, and the Lord uh, gave me a vision of Finn. And Finn was a real, he was kind of a scamp, you know, and always joking and goofing off. And um, he'd, all, he'd come up and eat meals with us, and he'd never get dressed. He'd be in short pants and T-shirts all the time. And, um, and I always liked it when he came because he'd be the first one to spill anything on the tablecloth, and his daughter could never complain. <laughs> so once he spilled, then I could. <laughs> And the Lord gave me this vision, and I saw Finn at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he was in shorts and a t-shirt. 
and he was laughing, and he was eating curry and roti, which roti is like a tortilla, you know, and he's just eating, and his fingers are messy, and he's nudging Jesus with his elbow, laughing, and Jesus is laughing. And the Lord said, that's what the marriage supper looks like. It's family. It's fellowship. And if we don't capture that understanding when the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper, we are missing everything about Christianity. So, what should we do now? I'm finished. <laughs> I want to close and... Uh, I, I think I'll do this. I think I'm going to try a, a song, and I don't need, I don't necessarily want you to, to help me per se, but this is your chance to shake hands. If you don't want to touch each other, air shake, give hugs, greet, interact. This is a big, we're ending with a big greet to each other because we're in this together. And uh, so we'll see how I do. And maybe Debbie can help me, and maybe she can't. <laughs> Well, you do. I just don't know if you can do it with me because it seems low. I have a lot more octane than you do. Yeah. <laughs> Meeting in the air. He sings so low. He needs to sing so low. <laughs> it's a solo. <laughs> oh. So first we'll sing it through one time, and then you guys get up and go. Hug everybody, just talk to them, say something. If you're afraid to be hugged, then keep your distance. Just do this. 